Hello, welcome to the combined Denver and Boulder Java user group meeting. I'm Greg Ostrovich. A uh, reminder that we're always looking for DJUG speakers and BJUG speakers. Uh, please email Matt Rabel or myself or send a message to the meetup site if you're interested. I'm going to go over some announcements and then I will introduce our speaker for tonight. So if you need the restroom, hopefully you can find one uh, where you're watching this. Uh, one of our sponsors is Tech Systems. Uh, they usually used to sponsor the food. And as I always say, um, we appreciate their support. And tonight's dinner is sponsored by whatever's in your pantry or your fridge. Um, our contact is Courtney Elterman. And there should be her information on the rolling slide deck uh, so that you can reach out to her. And uh, if you have a job opening, we appreciate um, these company's support of the Java Users Group. And so if you can support them, uh, that would be great. Another sponsor is JFrog. Um, uh, there's Courtney Elterman and uh, the sponsorship for Tech Systems. So just jumping back there for a second. Um, our next sponsor is JFrog. Uh, they've been doing some awesome giveaways and usually they'll have a QR code you can scan uh, or a bit.ly link. And so if that's gonna be there tonight, uh, Mike will put that in the chat. Another sponsor is Apex Systems. And they're um, usually our beer sponsor. Our contact is Braden Collip. Uh, but since uh, we're not meeting in person, tonight's liquid refreshments are sponsored by whatever's in your fridge, your beer fridge, your cabinet, whatever that is. Develop Intelligence, uh, they sponsor, they give away a plural site uh, before, and now I think they're, they're doing something a little different. No, they are doing the, I think they're doing the plural site every other month. Um, they're uh, looking to hire uh, technical instructors who specialize in several technologies for contract opportunities. Those include Java, Golang, JavaScript, React, DevOps stuff like Kubernetes and Docker and other technologies. So if you're looking for training for your organization or you're looking to work for them, uh, reach out. Uh, Bob Clary is our contact. Amazon is another sponsor. Um, it's usually Chris Almond or Sam Ayer, and they have a ton of stuff, uh, full stack uh, of development uh, positions open. So reach out to them if you're looking. Okta, um, they have a, they sponsor our meetup site, um, the online meeting, as well as the, um, uh, usually some giveaways, but when we've not been meeting in person, they haven't been doing that as much. And they used to sponsor the food after the meeting, but again, meeting virtually. So uh, next gen, um, Dana Esland is our contact. They're a consulting company specializing in federal government contracts and we appreciate their support. Agile Learner, a Venkat's Romanian's company. Um, it's agilelearner.com and they will probably have a, a conference this year. I don't know if it'll be virtual or not. JetBrains, we give away a couple of IDEs every year. We really appreciate their support. We usually give away uh, IntelliJ, which is more than just Java, it is actually kind of a suite that works for uh, different languages as well. There will be a link uh, for the door prizes that we give away tonight. And Mike uh, Zueda, who's running the broadcast tonight, thank you for that, Mike, will put that in the chat or in the comments. And just, uh, just a quick thank you uh, to Matt Rabel who arranges a lot of our speakers, uh, the locations that we do when we meet in person, uh, broadcasts for uh, the meeting, which tonight is actually gonna be Mike Suedo because uh, poor Matt is suffering in Cabo right now. So uh, best wishes to, to him and his family that are out there, um, I think having a good time. So uh, thank you to Mike Suedo who is running the broadcast, also does the door prizes, runs the web broadcast tonight and does other stuff to support us. Uh, Zeddy Chinfong, who does the operational stuff, including uh, social media, our announcements, and other things. We I really appreciate all of them, and without them, this wouldn't happen. So I'm going to have uh, Mike bring up uh, Chris Wyna, who runs the Boulder Java Users Group, uh, so that they can do a few thank yous as well. Hi, Chris. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, so similar thank yous. Uh, Tech Systems uh, have been sponsoring us for many, many years. Uh, James Corboy is our representative. If you're looking to hire or if you're just curious about what's going on in the market, they're really great people to talk to. Um, I believe they're America's uh, largest technical recruiter right now. 
We normally meet at Rule 4 Cybersecurity and Emerging Technologies. They were last year's uh, Colorado Technology Association Award winner. I think they were also CEO of the year. And even more amazing, they were one of the top companies that Outside Magazine said that you should work at. Uh, of course, no fluff, just stuff. Uh, Jay Zimmerman, world-class conferences and training. Agile developer, Venkat Subramanium. Uh, JetBrains, IntelliJ, uh, IDE, and O'Reilly Books. If you're interested in a JetBrains IDE license or um, Venkat's video learning series, I have probably um, several of each of those available. So contact me through the Boulder Java Users Group and first come, first serve, I'll get those to you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Chris. Um, and again, I um, not to be redundant, but thank you also to No Fluff Just Stuff and UberConf, who uh, sponsor us. Jay Zimmerman has been very generous with speakers and other resources and uh, giveaways to his conference, and we really appreciate that. So tonight's presentation is Gordon Weeklyum on coding interviews for Java developers. Now, Gordon did this lightning talk we were talking about before uh, before tonight's talk. Um, he did this a few years ago at our December meeting where we do those lightning talks and we usually have an ugly sweater contest. And I really I really enjoyed it. And I'm really looking forward to tonight's talk because interviewing is such a challenge. Um, and so this is a little bit about his talk. This really started to set the standard uh, for the modern software engineer interview. In particular, uh, this quote set the tone. Most of the time in the interview, though, uh, should be spent letting the candidate prove that they can write code. Somewhere along the line, Gordon's team started to suspect that maybe there were a lot of uh, software engineering candidates who couldn't actually write code. So maybe uh, making candidates write code became a standard practice. Uh, not all of us are performers, though, or perform well under pressure or with someone watching us. Uh, some of us don't spend our nights and weekends working on toy problems, and the day-to-day -day code we work on is anything but a toy problem. Or we work in an application framework or work on code that is in maintenance mode where we're not really writing tons of new code from scratch. When was the last time you wrote a main method? Uh, so the coding exercise is an alien environment. Uh, Gordon will talk about general advice for live coding as well as some strategies for succeeding in these coding exercises. Uh, particularly the live coding variety with an emphasis on pitfalls for use uh, for using Java in live coding interviews and strategies for getting around them. Uh, about tonight, tonight's uh, speaker, uh, Gordon has worked on as a professional software engineer for over 25 years. He has worked in distributed systems since the days when Corba, boy, that takes me back, uh, was the next big thing. I remember that. And has worked extensively with HTTP-based services as well as large-scale distributed data platforms. He's worked in the travel industry at companies like Sabre, Galileo, and VRBO, and currently works uh, for SiriusXM slash uh, Pandora Media, supporting the marketing team with big data analytics. In addition, uh, Gordon is a senior interview engineer with Carrot, an online interview platform, and has conducted hundreds of coding interviews. Um, and again, uh, look for the raffle. Um, Mike will provide the link. So without further ado, I'm going to have Mike bring up Gordon. So thank you so much for doing this tonight, Gordon. Hi. All right. Great. We're ready to go. Um, awesome. So yeah, uh, thanks for the intro, Greg. Uh, um, and thanks to Denver Boulder Java User Group. Uh, my name is Gordon McLean, as I said, um, and we're talking about interviewing for Java developers. I did do this lightning talk a little over two years ago, um, and uh, so I've expanded it a little bit, and uh, hopefully it's going to take more than 10 minutes to get through all this. So let's go. Uh, let's see. If I can get up. Oh, okay. Who am I? So... Um, I actually I hit 28 years of professional experience uh, this month. Um, that's when I graduated college and entered the working world. Um, and I'm a senior software engineer at Pandora Media, Sirius XM. Actually, my, my role has changed since I wrote that bio. And uh, I'm in the streaming services team now, which is uh, managing uh, you know, a lot of large scale Kafka. Uh, we're um, 
running about a billion transactions a day through uh, through all of our Kafka feeds. Um, so you know it's pretty big data, and um, probably more relevant to this, uh, I've been a senior interviewer engineer at Carrot for uh, a little over two years now. Um, if you're not familiar with Carrot, Carrot's a company that specializes in making technical interviewing fair and objective. If it sounds like I've delivered that line about 600 times, in fact, I have. I've, uh, I'm at exactly 667, uh, two thirds of the way to a thousand. So, um, and uh, yeah, I conducted a lot of interviews and I've done um, um, uh, about 180 uh, uh, quality control checks as well. So I've done a lot of interviews, I've seen a lot of interviews. And uh, I should note here that um, I'm an independent contractor. I don't work for Carrot. I don't represent Carrot. I don't speak for them or represent their views. So just need to get that out of the way that, you know, I'm not actually an employee. I'm an independent contractor and not speaking on their behalf. So um, anyway, we got that out of the way. Um, why are we here? Uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, <clears throat> here's, you know, the thing is, if you want to work in software development is that you're very likely going to have to prove your skills at some point. Now, actually, how I... How I really got interested in this was I went through a period of like 17 years where I never interviewed for a job. I went through, I think, four, four or five different jobs, and it was always through networking. And so these people knew me. They didn't, you know, make me, you know, they, they knew who I was and they knew what I was capable of. They didn't make me go through these coding exercises. But um what uh what happened was is I decided I needed to move on from the company I was at and, you know, didn't really have any contacts. And so I just sort of went out into the wild world of uh, dealing with recruiters and stuff. And man, that was a culture shock. Cause again, I think the last time I'd interviewed for a job, this was 2016. The last time I interviewed for a job, I think was 1997. Um, so uh, things had changed a lot and I, I really stumbled a lot and, you know, had a hard time, had some really difficult interviews. And so, uh, you know, I realized I, I'm, Back in my youth, I was a musician, and I, I realized it's like we don't really interview coding or uh, software engineers anymore. We uh, we audition them, and so because uh, it, it really felt a lot more like an audition from when I was a musician. So when we're hiring somebody, the as a employer, you the main question you want to know is how does how do you know somebody can do this job? That's the question you're trying to answer. You don't want to hire somebody who's not going to work out, and so you could just have a conversation to figure that out. Sometimes that works, and for a lot of jobs, that's that's just fine. Um, <clears throat> now there are some more formal ways with attorneys, and I've kind of developed a habit of or a, a hobby lately. If I find out somebody has an interesting job, uh, I ask them how they interview people for this job. And uh, so attorneys, you know, the thing is with attorneys is you have to pass this thing called the bar exam. People study like crazy for it. It's very difficult. Sometimes they have to take it two or three times to pass it. Um, so, you know, by the time an attorney gets into an interview, you know, they've, they've passed the bar, they're registered with the state, and you already have some baseline that you know that this person knows something about the law. Um, doctors, doctors, that's a really rigorous program. You know, you go through residencies, you're, you work under the supervi supervision of, a, you know, other physicians, you have to go through your board certifications, you know, there's all kinds of exams, you know, by the time you've by the time you've gotten to the point where you're trying to get a job as a doctor, you've had a lot of people look at you and approve your work and critique it and all of this. And so there's a there's a very rigorous program. And again, you know, when you go to hire a doctor at that point, yeah, you can have a conversation because lots of other people have already have already already signed off on you that yeah, you know, you do know what you're doing at you know at some baseline level. Uh, hairdressers or barbers, um, you know, even they have to get a state certification. You can't just open up a shop and start cutting people's hair. You have to have a cosmetology license. Uh, my friend, uh, my friend Sal, who uh, is my barber, I've gone to it for a long time. I asked him, you know, how do you, how do you hire barbers? And he says, well, honestly, it doesn't really matter if you have your certification. You have to pay rent in the chair, and so it's kind of like um, that's you know that's kind of your problem whether or not you can bring customers in. And so, uh, you know, I mean, obviously they, they want somebody who's going to last long term, but he says it's kind of not his problem. All you have to have is your certification. Um, salespeople, this is an interesting one. The, uh, the, the classic question apparently is uh, sell me this pen. Um, you know, you hold up a pen and have them put a sales pitch on for you. Um, you know, there, you might have other uh, things like, you know, tell me about how you meet your quotas. You know, how have you been meeting your numbers? Tell me about a time when you had to, uh, you know, you really had to stretch yourself and, and uh, change some things up, 
you know, so that, but, you know, you get more into the behavioral questions and, uh, you know, so that's, that's how they do salespeople. Apparently I'm not one. You could just pick at random. Apparently Mal Malcolm Gladwell, I think advocated for that. Um, uh, I, I think he actually does this to some level. You know, you could just pick somebody at random and, you know, whoever applies for the job, you just try them out. And I don't know, that's one way to do it. Um, so software engineers, this, this is the one we're really interested in, right? Um, number of ways you could do this. You could do a small project, you know, four to eight hours. Uh, that's, that's kind of a pain. You know, you're really asking a lot from somebody that, uh, you know, to spend you know, again, hours writing a project. And then you're also asking a lot from your staff because somebody has to go and evaluate that. And, you know, that's a, you know, four or eight hours is a decent amount of code. And so, um, you know, that's, that's one way to do it though. I've, I've been through those. You can pair program for a few hours. I've, I've done that as a candidate and uh, as an interviewer. Um, that's a pretty good way to learn about somebody. And uh, so you could do that. Um, you could do like a mini engagement. Um, 37 Signals apparently does something like this where, you get hired on a provisional basis, work in a few, work in a few tickets and, and they, uh, you know, or some small projects for them and they actually pay you for it apparently. And, uh, you know, so they kind of hire you on a provisional basis. You could do something like that. Or there's this one, you could solve this little problem for me while I watch. Um, and that is kind of the carrot model. That's what, if you were interviewed through there, you would, uh, do that. And, um, you know, this is, uh, really the focus of my expertise. And so that's what, this is the scenario that I'm really going to focus on. Although a lot of this really applies to everything. Um, so how'd we get here? Uh, Greg alluded to this a little bit in the beginning, but um, I'll just go over some history. Like when I started off, software engineers just got interviewed like everybody else. You just sat down, you had a conversation with the hiring manager. Uh, you might have a conversation with somebody on the team, um, but mostly, you know, uh, it was kind of assumed that, uh, you know, the basic skill level was there. In the 1990s, Microsoft became really famous for the interview style. Um, you know, they, they have all these questions, you know, reverse a string using uh, O of one space and don't use any extra space. And they asked crazy things. Why are manhole covers around? That was the famous one. Or how many gas stations are in Seattle? And this is back in the, again, in the 1990s, we didn't have Google, so you couldn't just look it up. Um, and that seemed to work for Microsoft. Microsoft got really big and successful that way. And they had a notoriously high hiring bar. Um, so, you know, that was one way. And then in 2000, Joel Spolsky released this Gorilla Guide to Interviewing. Um, most recent one out there, he revised in 2006, but I think I, all the essentials are there. And Joel is ex-Microsoft, so that probably, um, uh, he was at Microsoft in the early 90s, that probably colors his thinking on this. But the big thing was, is he advocated for hiring people who are smart and get things done. And what this came, a lot of the, the evaluation came down to most of the time, the candidate should be, or you should spend letting the candidate prove that they can write code. I put the link on there for you if you want to look it up. Uh, honestly, if you search for Joel Spolsky, guide interviewing, I'm sure that link will come up. So the thing is, is these days, people skills only get you so far and nobody wants to work with this guy, right? You know, um, uh, we, we've all seen the movie, right? Um, the, uh, you know, what happened is somewhere along the line as an industry, we started to suspect that there were a lot of software engineering candidates who couldn't actually write code. Um, and so we started the standard practice of making people prove that they could write code. Uh, that's just how we do it. Um, which is kind of a strange thing, you know, uh, uh, again, like I say, with, uh, doctors and attorneys and, you know, even cosmetologists, there's, a, there's all kinds of certification. Um, I think that speaks to how young we are as an industry and we're still maturing and things are changing a lot. So, um, uh, so here we go. Let's prove you can write some code. So how, how do you do this? Well, one way you could do it is on a whiteboard. You could just write it down and I've done those interviews. Uh, problem with the whiteboard is it doesn't really, the compiler doesn't work very well there. Uh, you're kind of assuming both that the candidate's not going to make mistakes and that the interviewer also can, you know, run a mental compiler. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, that's one way to do it though. And it's definitely popular. You could solve a problem unsupervised. Um, that's a model that like you might see with, uh, well, triple byte, I think focuses more on coding quizzes, but um, uh, I, uh, there are some other places that uh, just give you a 
you know, give you an online IDE and you solve the problem unsupervised, or maybe just submit, you know, they ask you to solve a problem and you submit the code to them. Um, then there's the video interview, uh, much like this. Obviously, it's increasingly popular. The We've had this global pandemic for going almost two years now. And um, <clears throat> for one thing, it got really hard to bring people into the office, even though companies still needed to hire. Um, you know, initially there was a lot of hiring freezes and stuff like that. And after a few months, we realized the world wasn't quite ready to end yet. And so we still had to hire people. And so a lot of companies had to figure this out real quick. Um, and the other thing is, is the reality is, is that software engineering is becoming a remote job. Uh, we, we tend to work remote. Um, and so I, at Sirius XM, I started there in uh, May of uh, two uh, or May of 2020. I have never, I have only met one person who is on my team in person. Um, and that is because I worked with her at a previous job. <laughs> I've never been to the office uh, with uh, Sirius XM. And so this is going to be the new reality, I think. So this is easy, you know, just fire up a video call. What could happen? Well, um, for you fans of Russian literature, I'm going to apologize in advance, but I've modified this quote from Anna Karenina. Um, All successful candidates are alike in their success. Each unsuccessful candidate is unsuccessful in their own way. Uh, I kind of had this observation um, maybe about six months ago that I realized that, you know, doing all of these carrot interviews, that the people who were really good, they were almost all the same. They were, they, were, they were kind of, they all had the same qualities. They worked efficiently. They, you know, everything just went really easily. And, but man, there's so many ways to mess up and uh, to do poorly. And so that's, that's kind of um, what I'm going to try and do is highlight some of those areas where, um, uh, highlight some of those areas where they change. And one thing I should say here is that, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that this is the best way to hire candidates, but it is an increasingly popular way. And my strategy with giving this talk is I'm trying to help people help give some advice to people so that they can deal with the situation as it is. Um, once you get hired into the job, you can argue all you want for a different way to hire people. But, uh, you know, we got to get the job first. Right. So. So what could go wrong? Um, you know, we we fired up this video call. What, what's what could possibly go wrong here? So, again, not all of us are performers, perform well under pressure, uh, perform well with somebody watching. I, again, I was, I'm, you know, I, I was a, music, a musician earlier on in life. Um, I'm kind of used to getting up on stage and, and acting like a goofball. But, uh, you know, not everybody is used to doing that. And honestly, even for me, it's, it's hard. I, I, I get nervous, too, um, even though I've done this a lot. Um, some of us aren't competitive coders. Uh, it's kind of freaky when you get one of these guys that they're they're amazing, but um, you know, we don't really work that way. You know, we don't we don't really work under that kind of time pressure. Um, we don't get neatly packaged problems on a daily basis, and uh, that's um, uh, that's a big thing. I at my job, you know, really pretty much every job I have uh, I've had very rarely get a nice neat little package that I can go and solve. I have to spend a couple of days talking to people. You go talk to the stakeholders. You have to you know, gather your requirements and stuff like that. I mean, if you have a good project manager or, or a product manager, they can, or a product owner, you know, they can take care of a lot of that for you. But a lot of the time you don't have that. And so you're kind of functioning as the product owner. You're, you're, and, and then software development is kind of, you know, one of the things you hopefully get to do on a good day. Um, and the dirty secret is that some of us don't actually get to write that much code day to day. Um, again, I, you know, in, in my current role, there's, a, you know, some significant operational stuff that I have to do. And, you know, when I actually get to sit down and write Java, that's pretty much a treat. So, you know, that, so the thing is, is the, the coding exercise is an alien experience. Um, you know, we're, we're not really used to working like this. So what could possibly go wrong? One of my uh, favorite quotes from a former principal engineer I used to work with. Um, so there's some stuff, there's basic programming skills. Um, not much to say about that. Uh, you know, uh, all, you, all you really can do is, you know, things like DJUG and BJUG are, are great for that. You know, going and learning about new things and leveling yourself up. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of books out there, um, things like that. But, you know, definitely, you know, it's great to be on top of what's happening in Java and, you know, ways to improve yourself as a programmer. Not, not much to say there. That's a practice thing. 
there's algorithmic knowledge. Um, algorithmic knowledge is um, uh, algorithmic knowledge is a big deal. And uh, I see Bruno has a, a question in the chat. I'll just address this a little bit. Um, I, I would say that for a coding interview, algorithmic knowledge is critical. Um, it, you know, uh, and it's it's kind of funny because we don't. Um, uh, when I was an undergrad, it seemed really critical to know how to navigate a graph. And um, I don't think I've actually ever written a graph search algorithm in my professional career. I'm trying to think back. I can't think of a time I've done it. Um, although, you know, it certainly could happen. There's language familiarity. Now, this is, um, you know, the, uh, to distinguish a little bit from basic programming skills, there's, you know, things where, you know, you just understand things about loops and recursion and, um, you know, all of these uh all these things. Jo Again, Joel Spolsky's big, big thing was pointers and recursion. He's like, you know, pointers and recursion are where the level of abstraction, so just some people can't get past that. But language familiarity is a different thing. And uh, that's one thing I definitely see with uh, uh, interview candidates that um, uh, if they knew some of the tricks, and I'll show some to you later, but if you knew some of the, the easy tricks, it'll, it makes your life easier. It saves you, uh, saves you some time. Um, and then we get into this specific problem, like not fully understanding the problem. Sometimes you see, uh, sometimes you see people launch into a problem. It seems like they understand it. They've, you know, told you something that sounds pretty reasonable, but then you real, you know, you realize partway through that no, they didn't actually understand the problem. They're mi they're missing some basic uh, thing, or so hopefully their candidate realizes it on their own before too long. Um, not planning an approach thoroughly. Sometimes you get candidates who just kind of wave their hands and say, "Well, I I just you know." I'll just kind of do this and that. And, you know, and then I really feel like there's a pretty strong correlation between being able to succinctly explain your approach and being able to execute in that approach. So, um, you know, again, you know, not planning on an approach thoroughly, not thinking through all of the, the, the educations and things like that. Um, so that's something to think about. And then, you know, the, the hard reality is, is Java is not optimized for developer speed. Um, it's, uh, it's just that's the way it is. Uh, there are things that make dynamic languages like Python and Ruby. They're kind of make them difficult in large code bases. They don't scale all that well, but they do increase developer speed. And you know that's that's the reason that a lot of these languages get used at startups because they just want to write things fast and crank them out. And then you know after about five years, they go and say, uh, you know, they go and say, gee, maybe we should write this in Java because it's a lot easier to manage at a. Uh, uh, I think Twitter was the poster child for that. They did it in Ruby on Rails and then realized after a while that um, uh, Rails was not going to scale the right way. And so, yeah, my best language is Java. You know, one strategy could be you could say, well, you know, I'm going to use Python because, um, I, you know, Python is better for developer speed. I can code faster in Python. Well, you know, one thing is, is that if you don't do Python day to day, you're going to spend a lot of time looking up syntax. You're going to be fumbling around. And so... That's one thing. The other thing is, is that if, the, if you're interviewing for a Java position, which uh, you're uh, absolutely, uh, you know, since we're all here at DJ Bjug, uh, you probably are. Um, they probably don't really care very much how, how good your Python is, but they do care how well you can write Java. So you should demonstrate that. So here's the downsides. Compilation will slow you down. Um, there is a compile step. Uh, you, you know, like in Python and stuff like that, you, you know, a lot of the time you can work within the REPL and you can try things out experimentally. It's a little harder to do that in Java. Uh, type checking will get in the way. Um, you know, you have to declare a lot of types. There's a, a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, there's just a lot of ceremony around a lot of that stuff. Um, and then some of these dynamic languages, Python, JavaScript, Ruby, they've got this language syntax that speeds up development. Things like uh, declaring uh, literal data structures, stuff like that. Um, it, it's just not as nice in, in Java, and, and Java's definitely improved that over the years, but it's still, you know, not at the level of, say, Python or Ruby. And then Java's a bit verbose. Um, uh, things have changed a lot since 2006 when Steve Yegi wrote Execution in the Kingdom of Nouns, but, um, it, the, which is a great long read, uh, uh, kind of absurd read about uh, how verbose Java is. But um, it is reverse, and we we tend to. There's a lot of ceremony involved. There's a lot of uh, typing, typing in the sense of fingers on keyboard, not in the sense of data types. But despite all that, you can write code quickly or quicker, and so um, 
you know, that's the, uh, um, so that's the, uh, that's the downsides. That's, that, that's what you're up against if you're going to be do, doing in Java. So some practicalities. Uh, first of all, is the playing field. You know, what IDE am I coding in? Um, very likely, I, I saw there was a question up here about practice code with that ID, IDE. Um, uh, on an online interview, you're very likely going to be using something like uh, maybe Repl.it, except probably not as full feature as Repl.it. Repl.it's honestly getting kind of scary good. But um, you know, you're definitely not going to have uh, on an online I mean, maybe you could screen share IntelliJ, but a lot of the time they want you to do it in their own IDE. Um, uh, that's uh, definitely the case with a lot of interviews I've done. I've interviewed with Amazon and Amazon has like their own IDE. Um, you know, uh, Carrot has theirs. Uh, the nice thing with the Carrot one is that um, uh, it records everything as it happens. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, you might have to you might have to use an alien ID that's not as full featured as Eclipse or IntelliJ, especially. Um, if it's an in-person interview, uh, you know, do I need to bring my own laptop? And even then, do I need to bring my own keyboard? I mean, I am I'm a big fan of mechanical keyboards, and I've gone into interviews, and I realized uh, the other weird thing about me is I like the Dvorak layout, and I realized that I have to bring my own keyboard with a little. Uh, dip switch on it so I can flip it over to Dvorak and, uh, you know, be more at home and not, again, not working in an alien environment. Um, again, will this be online or in person? Again, I'm, I'm focusing more on the online aspect, but that's a question. Um, you know, you, what, what are you going to need to bring, bring with you? And the thing is, is you want to prepare your environment in advance. And part of what that means is like, if you're going to be using a, an alien IDE, you know, see if you can try, you know, get a, a sample environment to mess around with and, and try that out ahead of time. Um, you know, things like that, or, you know, again, just practice in a less full featured IDE. Um, you know, there's, there's online ones like Repl.it and things like that. And so, you know, definitely try practicing without having all of the assistance because face it, IntelliJ makes us all lazy. I, you know, it makes me lazy. That's for sure. Okay, so let's talk some more specifics about online interviews. And online or online interviews are a little bit different, um, different beast. Um, first thing is, I would say, a good camera angle. You you want to think about a good camera angle. Um, many of us are working with a uh, a laptop. Uh, the laptop has a you know a little uh, camera in the screen. That's that's fine. You know, those are usually pretty good. Um, it's a little distressing to spend an hour looking up somebody's nose. So, you know, if you got to use your, your laptop camera, think about the angle, um, think about what you look like. I really recommend getting a, a, an actual separate webcam um, that you, know, you can put on top of your monitor, your main monitor or something like that. Um, they're not very expensive. It's like 30 bucks. I think I spent in mine. Um, it, it's a, a better experience. You know, it just gives you a better, better camera angle. You're not looking up at somebody, things like that. Uh, working mic and headphones, you know, definitely make sure that your tech is working. Um, I would not, again, I also, uh, prefer to use a separate, separate mic and headphones. You could work with what's in the laptop, but I feel like the quality is better. And certainly, uh, you know, you could work with the laptop speaker and no headphones. I definitely think the headphones are the better experience. Um, a good location. A coffee shop is a terrible location. Don't do it. Um, a dirty bedroom is not great. Uh, you know, Again, we're all working from home now, but uh, you know your prospective employer doesn't necessarily need to see how bad of a housekeeper you are. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's you know just uh, again we're we're trying to give a professional impression, right? And so uh, that I, I feel like that that definitely helps. And again, some of these online video interviews, it's not like Zoom where you can just throw up a background, and so you might have to think about that a little bit. You know, at least straighten up the room a little bit. And definitely, you know, if you're working at home with small children. Um, that's that can be an issue. You, you know, for some of these interviews, you might even think about if you've got a friend, you know, if you can borrow, you know, if you can go over to a friend's house for a while, you know, for an hour to handle an interview, something like that. I mean, and that's even just because, you know, sometimes kids have a tendency to barge in where they're not needed or something like that, um, or, you know, in, into rooms and things like that. So, you know, maybe, you know, again, it's not a requirement, but, you know, you, know, you might think about optimizing your location. And it's definitely for you, 
you want to cut down the distractions because you want to be able to focus on what's going on here. Um, good lighting. Um, I would say that, that that's really, really important. I've, um, I've conducted interviews where I felt like the person was interviewing for the witness protection program and not necessarily a software engineering job. Um, don't backlight yourself. Uh, you know, uh, you want to have some light in front of you. You don't have to go to the extent of like, I'm going to go out and buy a ring light and pretend that I'm an Instagram influencer, but definitely have some good lighting. Um, and, uh, you know, backlighting is, re is really bad. Again, you don't want to be like a, a silhouette. And uh, I, I always say have a glass of water handy. Um, you're going to be talking a lot. Glass of water. Uh, I even recommend some cough drops. I, I use these things, these Himalaya. Um, I love those. They, uh, uh, I got, I've really gotten hooked on them. And when you're talking a lot, definitely your voice gets scratchy. And it's just, you know, little things like that. It's good to have. Um, however, cocktail is not recommended. Um, stick to water. Uh, if you're asking... Yes, I have seen people drink during an interview. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend it. So <clears throat> let's go on to actual code. Or, you know, we're, we're, we've got the problem now. Um, let's talk about how we set up the approach. Uh, first thing I would do is talk through the approach that the interviewer understands you. Sometimes even if you look at a problem, you say, man, I understand this. I know what to do. You know, talk to the interviewer. Uh, first of all, this helps the interviewer follow along. And um, second of all, it help, I always find it helps me organize my thoughts to have to explain it to somebody else. And so spend 30 seconds even and just you know, say, well, you know, I'm going to do this and this and, you know, and then that. And that's how I'll do it. It doesn't have to be an elaborate presentation. You just talk, you know, discuss it briefly. If you don't have any interviews, viewer, uh, you know, if you're doing an unsupervised interview, putting a few comments at the, at the top of the at the top of the method or whatever, just so outline your approach. And, you know, you know, for one thing, it kind of shows that, yes, you can write some simple documentation. And for another thing, it does help organize your thoughts. And it also helps the interviewer far along or whoever's going to review it later. Um, ask some questions. Make sure you understand the question. Um, clarify an input. Uh, you know, make sure that you understand the input. Um, uh, ask about error handling. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't... Um, in a lot of these things, the, the emphasis is really on, we just want to see you handle a, uh, we want to see you implement an algorithm. We don't really care about all this null checking and idiot proofing your code and, you know, real real world code. Yes, we do a lot of error checking because data is never in a good state. But, you know, a lot of, you know, ask about the error handling, you know, will this data always be valid? You know, do I need to worry about that? Uh, think about some edge cases, you know, d definitely like, um, uh, you know, you can ask things about like, uh, you know, if you're dealing with arrays, well, do I have to worry about empty arrays? How big, you know, does my is my input going to be? Can I assume my input's going to fit into memory or things like that? I mean, um, uh, you know, again, just ask these questions. And uh, is the input immutable? Um, that's uh, that's something. Uh, it might be a rule that they don't want you to modify the input, and so um, you know, you might have to if you're going to. As you manipulate stuff, you might have to copy it over into another data structure. Just make sure that, you know, if you're thinking about modifying the input, find out if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, th this is a time limited thing. You don't have all the time in the world. Uh, these interviews are generally, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. So use it well. Um, and so one thing I've found is, you know, I, I say, how do I rephrase this as something I know? Um, uh, something I'm a lot more familiar with. Again, I, I, lo I love to pick and graph algorithms. For some reason, people love to include these in interviews. I never actually write any graph code, but um, you know, they, they love to include them in there. Uh, can I do this without having to fully implement like this whole graph data structure? Um, you know, do I really need to create a class? That's something in Java, man, we love to create classes. Um, and you know, do, do I need to do that? Do or, or can I get away with something more lightweight? Um, you know. So again, you know, think about that. These are some things that, uh, you know, you do do. If you do decide you need to create a class, do I need to, um, you know, do I need all the ceremony around getters and setters? You know, and probably not. Probably just, you know, and you might note that with the interviewer. Where they're like, yeah, I'm taking shortcuts here. I know that normally we do a getter and setter, but I'm just trying to save myself some typing. Um, the thing is, is you're most efficient when you're on familiar ground. So do, do what you can to make the you know to bring this problem into something that you understand uh, and something that you know well so um that's that general thing um 
uh, okay, so style. You're working in a hurry. You don't want to necessarily gold plate everything. It's not going to be the uh, the best code you ever wrote. But um, good variable names really help. Um, my big example here is you're indexing a two-dimensional array. So where do you name your indexes? Everybody defaults to INJ, right? We all do this. You know, you, you're, you're going to do INJ. Well, what is I? What is J? What does that mean? How about X and Y? You know, use like Cartesian coordinates. Well, the funny thing with arrays is that in, in Java, it's, it's a row major ordering. So actually, it would be Y and X, right? Your first index would be Y and your Y and your second would be X. I mean, I, I guess it's okay, you know, as long as you're consistent, but it can be confusing. How about row and call, you know? Put it into something where it's not going to confuse you later. And if you're concerned about uh, concerned about typing all those characters, R and C, you know, but give yourself a name that's not going to confuse yourself. You know, a lot of the time candidates will just put in something and they'll, they'll create a map. It'll be map. It's like, well, that doesn't tell me anything. And especially if you've got, say, for some reason, you have to create multiple maps and then you've got map and map two. And then it's like, again, one of the hardest things with programming is is maintaining the context and understanding what your, um, uh, you know, understanding what your, uh, what the problem is and not having to think about too many things at once. So definitely simple things like variable naming can help you out and, and not, not trip you up and not cre create more confusion. Uh, Java 9 has type inference for variables and uh, for generics. This, I hardly ever see people do this. You can just type, if you're declaring a variable, you just type var variable name and then declare, you know, allocate it. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I see lots of people, you know, you, you might create like a, a list of strings. And so they'll, they'll type list, angle bracket, string, uh, foo equals new array list, angle bracket, string. And it's just, that's a lot of typing. You can save yourself a lot of typing by just using type inference. Um, I, I personally, I use that in my production code, but, um, you know, and again, people argue about, well, you know, it's, I don't know, it's not, it's not as easy to follow. Well, you can make an exception for the interview because it'll save you a lot of typing, a lot of, a lot of keystrokes. Um, do you have any auxiliary libraries available? If you're familiar with Guava, if you're familiar with Apache Commons, things like that, they have lots and lots of useful things. And so find out, you know, what's, what do I have available to me? Um, you know, and if you're, if you're familiar with those, if you're good with those and you can use them without much without much fuss, I would, if they're available, use them, you know, again, put yourself on familiar ground. Um, and then again, I, I said this in the last slide, but we define classes for everything. It, that's some extra ceremony maybe you don't need. Um, on the flip side of this, you have to balance this out. Uh, sometimes it is good to create a class. And in a toy problem, you can get away with not overriding equals in hash code. Even, even if you're throwing them into something like a map that would, normally rely on a hash code. Well, you know, in a toy problem, effectively the the instances you're creating are kind of singletons. And so you don't have to deal with like the big wild world of data. And so um, maybe you can get away without actually having to write all that stuff. And so, you know, that, uh, you know, that's, that's a possibility. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I, I just happened to look down at the uh, questions. I see Jim Fox asked about pseudocode and to-dos. Uh, yeah, that's definitely one way to do it. People, you know, you can put in, you can outline stuff like in comments. Uh, do I wouldn't bother with to-dos, but um, necessarily, but definitely like pseudocoding little bits of it and then flushing that into real code. I've seen I've seen candidates use that successfully as a way to organize their thoughts. So that's definitely something you could do um, as a way to uh, organize things. So let me move into some more specific things. Um, let's talk about arrays. Um, a lot of programming problems get stated as arrays. Your inputs are done as array. Uh, in Java, arrays are a weird second class citizen, right? You know, think about it in your code. How often do you really, you know, really the only time we use arrays are when we're really concerned about performance or you're doing something very low level, like, you know, byte level file IO and stuff like that. So we don't, normally use them too much. We use other collections and Java treats them that way. They're, they're kind of weird. Um, so, you know, just because it's an array, first of all, doesn't mean you have to write in a loop. If an array is fixed size, I, I've seen people do this all the time, that uh, they'll get, they'll get a two an array that's nominally two dimensional, but really like every item in the array is say three elements long. And so you don't need an inner loop. You just access each of those three elements as a, uh, you know, 
as an individual thing because all they're really doing is it's like it's kind of like uh you know just organizing the input and they're it's almost like being handed the csv right and so you don't you know you don't need to loop over that inner array because it's fixed size there's there's nothing you know there's nothing to loop on um so you could just copy it to collection if that's easier to work with so yeah absolutely if if take take the time and write a little thing to put it into a uh, a list if you're a lot more familiar with lists or you know or, or you know definitely if if a map or a set fits the problem use that and uh you know one thing is don't you don't have to get too fancy you don't have to you know sometimes people get tripped up on using streams and things like that you know don't, don't be afraid to resort to a, a while loop or a for loop um if you need to write the loop just do it you know do, you don't again um do what you need to do to get the code working and then um if there's time if there's if the you know if the interviewer is bothered by something and saying, well, I don't like that style. Can you change that to something else? Then address it. But, you know, or, and, you know, you can even say, um, uh, you know, it, you can even say, you know, look, normally I would do it this way, but I'm in a hurry. I'm just going to do this. So let's talk about some power tools. Um, Java Util Arrays, I, I feel like I definitely underappreciated this whole thing when I, uh, when I started out, um, I, I would say it's a good idea to read the documentation on this one. Um, at least be familiar with what's there. Arrays.stream gives you instant arrays of stream. If you're the kind of person who likes to program in streams, bang, there you go. Um, lots of other helpful methods for sorting, searching, copying, printing. Um, there's 100% no reason to write a loop to print out an array. Um, Arrays.toString does a great job. Arrays.deep two string works on multi-dimensional arrays. Use those. You should never write a for loop to print out an array. Um, <clears throat> so uh, some practicalities on uh, working with collections. Um, I kind of jokingly say, if you're not using a map, you're probably doing it wrong. You're probably, you probably have the wrong approach. Uh, maps are, especially in these kind of little toy problems, man, they're super, super useful. And they're, they're way more useful than Certainly, I realized at first you can create quick and good, dirty trees and graphs without having to create the full ceremony of like node classes that have pointers to other things. Uh, you can just kind of do it quick and dirty in a map. And it's definitely not like code that you necessarily want to put into production. But hey, you know, it, it, it works and it allows you to demonstrate the algorithmic knowledge, which is really probably what they're after. If they're if they're asking if they're giving you a tree problem or a graph problem, they're really more looking at how are you going to, uh, you know, how are you going to handle the algorithm than, you know, how are you writing a data class? Um, uh, let's see, um, map operations. So that there's uh, some, some really good shortcuts in here. So like if you're loading up a map, um, you know, there, you could do like this contains key and then put, or you could do like get or default along with a put, or you could go to com compute if absent. And this one really, I'll show some code later. This really applies to if you're creating a map from like uh, a, a, a value to a collection um, and you need to initialize the collection on the first access. Uh, you can definitely save some time there. And then think about the keys. Uh, if you're gonna use a map, solve problem, uh, your, your first instinct not, might not be right. So maybe take a second and think, what if you flip the map and you switch the keys and values? Is that gonna help you solve the problem better? Sometimes it works. Sometimes that that gives you a little insight and it makes the problem tons easier. I'd say don't forget about sets. Uh, they really can be super useful in a lot of these problems. Um, I, I feel like Java programmers, from what I've seen, they uh, these sets are way underappreciated in, in our community. And uh, I think, again, it's probably something that in our day-to-day -day code, we don't necessarily write them a lot. Sometimes we use them and don't realize it and don't really use the full power of them. Uh, one thing is that the Java set operations are not obvious at all. Uh, so retain all, it would be called intersect in some other languages. Remove all would be difference. Uh, add all as union, stuff like that. The other thing you have to be careful with with sets is that these operations are all destructive. So you have to be, they're destructive to the set. If you, uh, if you do a... Uh, like a retain all, well, all of these operations will change the underlying set. And so just, you know, be a little careful with that. Um, so let's look at a little bit of code. Um, 
And since uh, I like to pick and graph problems, I, let's think about uh, a, a problem that involves a DAG. And it's uh, I, I kind of pseudocoded out a crude ASCII art diagram down at the bottom here. We've got A goes to B, B goes to C and to F, C goes to D and G, uh, D goes to E and G goes to H. That's the model here. And so um, our input's going to look like this. It's going to be uh, you know A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, and again. This is a two-dimensional array, but the inner dimension is fixed, and it's not really indicating an array in the traditional sense. It's more like this is just a crude, this is just a crude data structure, you know. So, you know, and you might see problems stated this way. So let's look at that. So one thing is it's easy to model a graph with a map. Um, you can just have a key and a value. And in this case, maybe what we could do is we could just take A and, or we could take the first thing and make it the key, the second key, second thing is the value. And then to navigate through this graph, we just go from key to value. You look up, you know, you grab the graph, look up, you know, whatever's at that key, that's the value. Well, that's the next node in the graph. And that's how you navigate through. It's just by going from key to value. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, here, here's some code that writes up a graph. You see, we've got this map from character to a list of characters because the reason we do a list is because some of these nodes have multiple, you know, this graph can go to multiple places. And so we have a list of all the places that you can go from a particular uh, node in the graph. And so here's here's some basic code. You know, we loop through the, we loop over this thing. We set up i, i less than length. We're gonna look and see if that first value is in, the, in there, if it's not, we put in a new array list to initialize it with our new value, and then we um, and then we get that value and add a uh, and add our our destination to it. Um, you know, and for the first destination, we just added that array list. Otherwise, we're just adding to something that's already there. And then I just demonstrate this down at the bottom. Uh, if you were to copy this on here, uh, you know, if you were to copy this code into your own IDE or whatever, you, you could see that yeah, this will print it out. The point of doing this is that, um, again, uh, well, I'll cover this in a later slide, but the point is, is it's pretty easy to print these things out. So can we do better? Can we save ourselves a little bit of typing? You know, that, that's fine. That's straightforward to follow. But how about this? Um, first of all, we can use like a for each loop. That saves you a little bit of typing. You notice here, I, 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 I practice what I preach. I use var. I, you know, just var, you know, I, I know what it is. The context is small enough. I don't have to worry about like, a type dec declaration, so I can I can put that in. That saves me some saves me some characters, and then I just get our default on this thing, and so that way, if there isn't a value, it'll create a new value, and then you add the value to this list, whatever that list you got was, and then you al also have to put it back into the graph or into the map rather, because um, that value may not be um, uh, uh, that default value, if it returns a default value, it's not actually in the map yet. So you have to you have to go through the ceremony of putting it back in every time just to ensure that it's there. Um, can we do we can do even better than this, really? And this is where I get into this is where it helps to know some of these more exotic operations that you don't always know. Uh, so here we create this new graph. Um, I did violate my practice, or I, I did violate my practice a lot of the time. I would type var and then put that elaborate full type thing on the other side, but I uh, violated my practice. And again, we'll just use that for each syntax. And now we do compute if absent on this key. And if it's absent, it's going to create a new array list. Well, the, the interesting thing about compute if absent is that it's got a side effect, is that new array list is now associated with that key in the uh, map. And so if there is no value there, it's going to create a new array list and put that as the value. And then it'll return it. And so you can just take that return value, add your p sub one to it, and there you go. So this is a lot shorter, and um, you know, yeah, we've saved yourself a lot of typing, and uh, we could have even saved more if I had uh, used used type inference for that first variable. Um, so there's that. Yeah, and this is this is pretty slick. This is you know, we saved yourself, you know, hopefully saved yourself some time. And again, if you understand, if you just remember this this little trick with computer Fabson. You know, it's, that's a useful thing. And I think it's a, even a helpful thing in production code that, you know, we should be, these are powerful things that are in the language. This is available since uh, JDK 8. And yeah, it's available there. We should use it.
So, um, or if you're a stream person, um, you could use streams. I don't know. To me, this is some. I have to. I have to Google this every time. I can't remember this. My brain can't. I, I actually do like stream programming, but the the whole grouping by thing just freaks me out every time. So I, I always have to look it up. But you know, if you could do that too. Uh, the one thing I think with streams is that they're awfully verbose. Uh, I, I'm a I'm a big fan of Kotlin. Kotlin the streams are a lot more seamless. So uh, I mentioned earlier that sets are un unappreciated. I thought I'd throw in some code here just to demonstrate um, some ways to do that. Um, so let's just say we've got a map from character to character, slightly different uh, thing um, than what we had before. And we'll we'll just pretend that it got initialized with some variable values. So now you have a map full of characters and we wanna see, let's calculate the intersection of the keys and values. And so the way you would do that is you can just intersect uh, you create a new, you, you create new uh, hash sets from the values and from the keys. The reason you create new hash sets again is these are destructive operations. You will wreck your, uh, you'll wreck these collections by doing these operations on them. So definitely uh, make a copy of them, and then uh, just intersect dot remove all. That's you know that makes intersect the actual intersection. Um, and if you print that out, you'll see that. Uh, or you can do retain all, and now that's the union. So values now is the union of uh, your keys and values. And so those are that's just a demonstration of how we do these. Again, it's very unfortunate these these are not well named uh, methods. Um, you know, I realize that they are part of uh, lower level interfaces. It would have been really nice if they had uh, thought to add some methods that alias these just to make it easier to use. Um, so that's that's sets. Uh, again, I think sets are super useful, and it's a great way to look at a lot of these problems. And really, that's kind of the uh, that's um, what is it? The you know, it's it's like cutting the Gordian knot, right? Where it's it's just a clever way to slice through a problem instead of having to write, write a lot of stuff. So um, let's talk about debugging. You know, you've written your code, doesn't work right. You gotta you gotta figure out what's happening. So. Um, First of all, assume you won't have an ID or certain not, not a full featured one. You won't be able to set breakpoints and watches, so that's that's going to be a that's going to be a problem. You have to use print statements, so learn to use your print statements. Um, don't be afraid to work incrementally. Um, as you're, a lot of people feel like they have to like big bang this thing and write the whole problem and then debug the whole mass. And you know, if you make a mistake early on, that really can mess you up. So, you know, a lot of successful candidates I see they'll say, okay, well, first I have to take this input. And again, I used a map earlier. So, you know, first I'm going to take this input, I'm going to put it into a map and they'll write that code and then they'll print it out and they'll test their code and they say, yes, this does what I expected. Great. And move on. And again, working incrementally like that is a nice way to keep checkpointing and, um, and, you know, give yourself confidence in what you're doing. Uh, read the compiler error message. Um, a little bit of a silly thing, but I've definitely seen people go deer in the headlights when they see uh, cannot call method foo from a, 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 a static context. What does that mean? Well, it just means you forgot to put static, you know, declare foo static. But, you know, sometimes people or, you know, it's other things. People just sit there and, you know, uh, kind of lose their mind or, you know, they just kind of freeze up over, you know, a lot of it input. And definitely, you know, we all know we all program in Java, um, misplace it, you know, forgetting a... Uh, uh, forgetting a parenthesis, forgetting a curly brace, can throw the uh, can throw the compiler into a world of hurt. It'll print out six thousand error messages. Scroll all the way up to the top, and uh, you'll probably see something about, uh, "Hey, you forgot your curly brace," and then none of the rest of the stuff matters. So um, you know that's again, um, you know, uh, sometimes candidates will sit there at the bottom, at, you know, looking at nine error messages and not realizing that the real problem is up at the top of the list. So scroll to the top. Um, last thing is for debugging. If you're doing print line debugging, two string almost always does something reasonable. So don't waste time writing loops and formatting it unless you have to. Uh, you know, um, all of those collections print out something reasonable that's pretty readable. Um, and, you know, so don't waste time printing out collections, writing a loop to print them. Two string usually does the right thing. Um, arrays are exception. Uh, for this one, you use arrays.toString. If you've got a multi-dimensional array, use arrays.deep2String. Um, again, 
that works really well and nearly all it always will give you something you can work with. And then if you define a class that you do need to print, override two string. This is one place where it, it, it makes sense to you know write a little extra code because I've seen, you know, again, I've seen places where people go and they define this class and they do field access and stuff like that. They didn't spend a lot of time in getters and setters. But then you know they're they're writing all this co extra code just to print out stuff. And it's like, man, just two string, two string the thing. And then you just hand it to uh you hand it to um um print line and it works. So yeah, you know, just Think about that stuff like, you know, gee, if I, I could save myself some time, if I just, you know, here's a place where writing a little extra code will in the end save me a little bit of time. So think strategically. Um, and then the end, you know, we want to show results. And again, the, if you recall, the question we're asking is, can this person write code? Can they do the job? And the best way to do that, um, best way to do that is to write working code, write code that solves the problem. And you know, it's understood, especially in these, you know, if you've got one of these four or eight hour projects, you definitely want to write something prettier that's nicer. But man, if, if you're in a, you know, if you've been given 30 or 45 or 60 minutes to, to solve a bunch of coding questions, you're working in a hurry. And just, you know, respect that and just say, you know, yeah, I'm working in a hurry. I'm going to take a bunch of shortcuts. Job is going to slow you down. You know, it's, you, I, I believe that um, programmers of equal skill, the Python programmer is always going to write code faster. Um, you know, get, assuming the same skill level, it's just a faster language to work in. So you got a little bit of a, you know, we do have a little bit of a handicap, but I mean, that's, we are interviewing for a Java position. So you do want to demonstrate, you know, Java, uh, do what you need to clarify your thinking. Um, I, <clears throat> if you like to work with a pen and paper, if you like to work with a, a whiteboard, do it, you know, um, again, put yourself into put yourself into a mode that's most like the way you would normally work because that's going to put make you most comfortable. So if you like to work in a pen, if you like to work in a notebook, use the pen and paper, do it, you know? Um, and again, you know, if you really need to, you can hold up your notebook to the interviewer and, and, and show it to them or something like that. But, you know, unless they tell you, unless they tell you no, you know, I'd say go ahead and do it, do what makes you comfortable. Um, and don't get tunnel, tunnel vision. You know, people get really focused in on this, you know, especially when you get into like, you know, this code isn't doing what, what I want or I'm getting confused. If you've got a live interview there, rubber duck with them, you know, talk talk through stuff, uh, bounce your ideas off of them. And, you know, a lot of the time, uh, definitely for me, just the act of verbalizing what's happening makes me organize my thinking. And, um, you know, so it's it can be really helpful. But code is, code is greater than talk. You don't have to overexplain. You don't have to explain every single thing you're doing. Sometimes candidates will slow themselves down by getting into this elaborate discussion. Um, and especially in time and comp space complexity, I wouldn't even, first of all, I wouldn't even worry about it unless they actually ask you. So don't go into the analysis. You know, d d I wouldn't even spend time thinking about what's the complexity of this. I would just say, will this work? And, um, you know, and, you know, certainly you could spend a, you know, you could spend a minute if you, if that's the only approach and you think, wow, this is, seems really inefficient. Maybe I could do better. Maybe spend a minute trying to think of something, but, you know, don't stress it. Just, you know, hey, I can get this to work. So let me do that. Um, and if they do ask you time and space complexity, don't, you know, you don't need to boil the ocean on it. It's big O, right? It's an estimate. And so just give your best estimate and move on. You know, if they're, if they're going to ask you in some of these formats, they'll ask you multiple coding questions. It's way better to move on and get on to another question than it is to, you know, absolutely nail all the details of what the big O complexity of your uh, of your algorithm was, you know. So, and um, yeah, so you know, it, it definitely helps. It can help to uh, explain yourself to an interviewer. But you don't have to overdo it. You don't have to narrate every single thing you're doing. And the last thing is, and this really relates more to um, uh, questions about your knowledge, uh, like system design questions, like uh, <clears throat> um, uh, system design questions, especially. Sometimes these things will be fra phrased as, here, let me give you this. Let me outline this design for you. How do you think this will work? What's wrong or what's wrong, what's wrong with it? And they're not asking if the, if all they ask you is what's wrong, they're not asking for a solution. So don't start solutioning. Just answer the question. You know, 
um, the, the if they ask you what's wrong with something, tell them what's what you think is the problem. And then if they ask you for a solution, you can offer a solution. But, you know, stick to the questions, um, you know, a, a answer the question you're asked. Uh, another thing I see, too, is that sometimes um, candidates, especially very experienced candidates, you'll ask them something like, you know, uh, you'll ask them some question. They'll be like, well, that depends on if you're using uh, Windows or Linux. And it's like, you know, just give me the textbook answer, man. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, if if we can drill into it if you want. But, you know, it's don't spend, all, you know, don't spend a lot of time, you know, work, work with work in generalities. And then if they want and, you know, you can know that yeah, this is different in different operating systems, stuff like that. But, you know, don't boil down into like, you know, these micro details. Answer the answer the question. And then move on from, you know, if they, if they, if the interviewer wants you to drill down, if they want to ask you, well, how does that work in Linux though? Okay. Then they're, you know, that's fair game, but you know, you know, work in generalities and then work down to the specifics. Um, and, uh, you know, getting down here, your attitude. Um, so I, I say, don't change your style, work in the way you're used to. So again, if you like to work with pen and paper, do that, unless they tell you, no, do that. Um, you know, again, you you might have to compromise a little on the IDE, but you know, work uh, try to um, <clears throat> try to work in you know as much as you can. Try to work in the way you used to, and we all understand nobody likes interviews. I mean, I I don't know. There's there's probably a few people out there. I, I know when I gave this lightning talk, I asked how many people liked coding interviews, and half a dozen people out of a room of like fifty raised their hand. So there are definitely some people who really enjoy this stuff, but mostly people don't. Um, but on a related thing, nobody likes working with people who aren't capable and we're trying to figure out who's capable. And so, um, you know, you know, th that's, this is kind of the, this is the compromise we have. So, um, and the last thing is, is uh, don't talk yourself down. And especially if you're like me, you've got, uh, a lot of years in here and, uh, you've got a lot of gray hair to show for, it. um, you know, I I've seen some candidates really get down on themselves and, uh, you know, don't talk yourself down. You know, if you, if you tank an interview, it's not the end of the world. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't mean you're a bad coder. Um, you're probably, you know, a lot of, you're just not used to it. And um, so, you know, it's, it's not a reflection on you as a person. Um, it's just a reflection of how you did that day. So, you know, the, 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 and, and the thing is, is that if you're not very good at this, I, and again, like I say, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm a great interview. I'm definitely better than I was six years ago when I went through that you know, my shock of having an interview for the first time in 17 years. But, you know, you can get better at this. There's there's all kinds of sites out here. I've listed uh, a whole bunch of them. Um, uh, interview Cake is a newsletter that I really, really like. Uh, it's, it's unfortunately, it's I, I had to unsubscribe from it because it's a massive amount of information. And But I really like the way he walks you through uh, solving problems. And um, I, I really recommend that if you're going to enter an interview cycle. Uh, Advent to Code just wrapped up. You, you know, if you practice that in, in December, um, you know, that's something you can do. Cracking the Coding Interview, uh, I always recommend that book. I think it's a great book, um, especially if you don't really have a formal computer science education. Uh, she goes through a lot of the basics of algorithms. Um, it's a lot more approachable than, say, like uh, a formal algorithms textbook. Um, but it's really enough to get you there. Um, or if you're like me and college happened during the George H.W. Bush uh, presidency, um, that was a long time ago. Um, so it helps to brush up on that stuff. And I, I don't necessarily want to pull out my old algorithms textbook. Um, live coding practice, pramp.com, interviewing interviewing.io. They will actually walk you through um, a live interview. I've never actually used these sites. They've been recommended to me. I haven't, I haven't actually used them, but I've heard great things about them. And so that's one way you can practice with somebody and, uh, you know, in a in an environment where it just doesn't matter. You know, there, there's no job at the end of this, but you just get in practice. And then, you know, one thing you can do is just give yourself a toy problem in a fixed amount of time. And how do you do? And, you know, give yourself 30 minutes, give yourself 45 minutes, whatever. And um, <clears throat> what I would recommend here is that if you're going to do that, um, Stick to the time limit. You know, uh, don't don't let the the thing roll over. Even if you get stuck, even if you get frustrated, just stop it after. If you say, "I'm giving myself 30 minutes," stop after 30 minutes, and then take stock and evaluate. And this is how we learn, right? You you fail, you mess up, you reflect on what you did, what you could have done better, and then you work on that. And so that's you know that's kind of how I would recommend doing that. Is like, yeah, give yourself a problem, give yourself a fixed amount of time. How did I do? 
And then, you know, again, repetition, uh, you know, repetition helps. So, you know, try that out. Um, and that's all I got. So, you know, best of luck. Uh, uh, again, you see my copy of Cracking the Coding Interview has been well loved and uh, uh, um, Carmen's book has been pretty, pretty beaten up too. So um, I put some contact info on there and uh, I guess we can go to questions. Uh, let me, I, I tried to answer some of these as I went, but let me scroll back. Yeah, I can uh, put some up, Burn. We'll give people some time if they want to ask um, some new questions. Yeah, definitely. If you if you if you've spotted any that you want to um, pull up, uh, certainly do that. Um, this was one by Matthew, but in general, uh, I guess he was asking if there's a best way to conduct an interview for Java programmers or a particular method that you yeah. like best. Yeah, I think the I think these are valid. I, I think that you know the. Uh, um, I think that the online interview, you know, you definitely should, uh, um, you definitely should dedicate some, especially for senior engineers, you definitely should dedicate some time to, uh, asking system design questions and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I actually, I, I, I should have stuck in, uh, some resources for that. There's a, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, best system design resource I've seen out there is this guy, Donnie Martin. So D-O-N-N-E Martin. And if you just search for Donnie Martin system design, he's got a GitHub. Um, you can check out the entire repo. He's got tons of great stuff on there. Um, and I, I really like that as a resource. There's a few other articles, but that one is pretty comprehensive. Cracking the coding interview also covers some of that stuff. Um, I, you know, uh, I, I think that you should evaluate a candidate on their ability to communicate. Um, you definitely run into these things where uh, people are people. People can write code really well, but not explain it, and that's fine. If I, I think if somebody's going to be working in a vacuum, um, but you know, if it's going to be one of these things where you're going to get a person who can turn out tons of code and zero documentation, um, you know, maybe is that what you want to have in your team? So d definitely, you know. As an interviewer, you know, when your company asks you to interview people, um, I would say spend some time thinking about what kind of person do you want to hire? And it's not just, you know, can they write Java? It's like, can they, you know, can they work cooperatively? How do they, and, you know, you might even ask some questions about what, like what kind of merge strategies you like to use and uh, things like that. You know, th things about managing stuff like, um, uh, you know, how they, how they manage projects and get and stuff like that. Uh, you know, what, 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 what's the branching strategy you like? Um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a, a point where you can uh, find out something about a person. So, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I jokingly say that really the, uh, the, the interviews we should do are, are the ones where we have somebody to try to rebase a, re, rebase a branch onto master. That's the, where the, the merge is going to be messy because that's like, <laughs> that shows somebody's true metal. Uh, that, that is a good point. Um, for my company, we do things like um, how to do code reviews. So we have questions with like mock um, code reviews. We have things with uh, mm -hmm. refactor this code. So there's already existing code and um, write a test for this code. So uh, different aspects of programming, not just uh, solve a problem. Yeah, those are definitely good strategies. And again, a lot of my, a, a lot of my experience is with the initial with the initial coding interview where they're just trying to figure out, you know, does this person know how to write code? And, you know, um, that kind of scratches the surface, kind of gets a, a an idea of what, uh, um, what you can do or the, um, uh, but, you know, I mean, you're not going to get into, you know, one of these deep discussions that, you know, you definitely, you know, need to have an hour just talking through a design problem. Uh, so yeah, which is better writing tight, valid, syntax java code or coming up with an efficient design um i guess i would say what's best is writing code that works that solves the problem that's my personal opinion um and uh i think that efficiency counts some i think that probably coding style probably counts the least especially again if you're working in one of these time limited formats where you only have you know 45 minutes you're going to be taking shortcuts and granted, you know, like in a, a real coding environment, you know, we use stuff like Lombok and stuff like that to help us not have to manually, you know, do all this boilerplate. 
but um you know uh i would say um you know uh style probably counts the least uh i i you know again solving the problem is the biggest thing i i would say that like an efficient design is second uh and then um you know and then like your your style is probably the lowest thing and again mostly because you're pressed for time all right next is a question from mike uh is carrot like hacker rank or leak code um uh, so I think that they, I think that if you go to the site, there might actually be a little bit of a demo on there, like a, a, a video demo. Um, hacker rank, we do, you know, Carrot considers hacker rank to be a, a competitor because hacker rank does have a, uh, uh, does have an interviewing component to it. Um, and companies can use it. Hacker rank is an unsupervised interview. Uh, Carrot is a supervised interview. You have your face to face with someone like me. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, from my understanding is with hacker rank, you're, you're working, solving the problem on your own. And so, um, there's no, there's no personal interaction. So again, that's, uh, you know, that's part of, I think, uh, what carrot sells is one of the benefits is that you have a experienced software engineer who's there like evaluating and, you know, um, providing, uh, you know, uh, providing some feedback on that part of it. Okay. And then we had a question again from Juan asking about um, resources for soft skills. Yeah, um, I I don't have uh, I don't have a great thing. Unfortunately, I don't have a great thing there. I I, I should find out more. I um, uh, uh, I definitely have some friends who are executives and stuff, and I should uh, uh, I should definitely uh, round out this more. Um, I think that uh, I don't have any specific resources. Put it that way. Uh, Cracking the coding interview definitely talks a little bit about that. So you know, again, <clears throat> I think there's a chapter in there. Um, other than you know, I I definitely think it's a it's a big thing to be able to communicate effectively. And you know, with some people, you do have a language barrier. Maybe English isn't your first language, and so it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge. But um, I think that. Uh, uh, you know, it's important to be able to state your thoughts in a, uh, in a coherent way. And I'm making this mistake right now. Uh, somebody told me once that, uh, they don't, they broke themselves of the habit of saying, um, by just allowing silence to happen. And they consciously think, don't say, um, just be silent. And so there's my one little, my one little tip there, just, uh, you, you can, you can get rid of the noise words in there just by forcing yourself not to say them. Uh, there's just a comment that said the book, uh, The Effective Engineer, um, oh. I guess was good for soft skills. So okay. that's something if people want to look into it. Yeah, definitely. I'll have to check that out. Um, I learned something today. Um, next question was, I guess, if you had any specific advice for uh, like the design part of the interview rather than coding. Um, Mm, well, you know, it's it's difficult to say because I can't say what this particular employer would have been looking for. Um, uh, again, you know, I, I think that to the point of seven, you know, saying seven classes, um, I imagine that this was a longer a longer duration interview than you know an hour um, to to write that much code. Um, if it is a longer duration interview, I would say that, and honestly, I've had poor, I've had very poor luck with personally with these project interviews. I've, I've turned in things which had, you know, the code worked, it solved the problem. It had a full suite of tests and a full suite of integration tests. And, you know, I, the, and they didn't move forward with the, with the thing. I was like, man, this is like the best thing I can do. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this is, I don't know, maybe, maybe that gave the wrong impression. Maybe they said, ah, oh, this guy's, this guy's, uh, too, uh, he's he's uh too process oriented and, and we don't want you know we just want somebody who's going to hack out stuff and get it done so um uh that's that's a really good question it's hard to say i i think that and companies tend to be cagey about the reasons for a rejection but um you know it's uh, again i think if i were to get a project assignment um like that in the future, I think I would ask and say, you know, what do you want to see here? You know, 
do you want something that's, do you want me to produce something that, you know, I think is professional quality? What are you looking for? And, um, uh, you know, uh, what are your expectations? And again, you know, I, I think that's valid because I think when you get onto the team, you should have that conversation. So, um, I, you know, Anju, I, I don't know exactly, you know, what, what the rationale was there, but, uh, you know, again, I've had poor success with these project kind of, um, deals. And I would say that, um, probably, uh, in the future, if I were to hit one of those, I think I'm, I, I would definitely ask explicitly, what are you looking for here? What are, what are your expectations for the, the finished product? Okay. And then, um, we're going a little bit over. So the last thing I'll put up here is just a uh, thank you from Jonathan. And uh, I'll repeat his sentiments and say, uh, you know, thank you, Gordon, for joining us today and giving us your information. Um, I guess if people have more questions, um, they can reach out to you on the email that you gave or through our meetup site. And yeah. um, I'll ask if it's possible, if you um, have these slides, is that possible for you to put up on our meetup site? Yeah, I'll put them into the, I'll put them into the comments. And uh, uh, I, I did, did want to address what Amherst said here uh, about interviews, this just difficult algorithms, but they do credit operations and, you know, their, their, their whole job is, you know, you're, you're, they're asking graph algorithms for, and you're just going to be doing cred stuff. And, um, you know, um, I don't know. I think that, you know, th there's probably a little bit of an ego trip involved there and that, um, you know, and they're really not, th if, if that's your style of interviewing, you're really not doing yourself any favors because you're not, uh, you know, you're not interviewing for the skill that people are actually going to use. Um, and again, this is kind of a standard joke that, you know, we, we ask all these questions about, we love to ask these questions about graph algorithms. And again, in 28 years, I don't think I've ever written a graph, <laughs> a graph search algorithm. So. There it is. It also goes both ways on, on the interview. Sometimes the question um, gives you insight on whether or not you want to work for the company. And so mm -hmm. if you're not really enjoying the interview, that may signal that you don't actually want that job. That's very, that's absolutely true. Yeah, I, I, I agree that sometimes what you find out in the interview is that you don't want to work there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, well, thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I don't see any more questions coming in. So I'll just say. Uh, Thank you one more time and thanks for everybody else for uh, showing up and asking good questions. And uh, I guess we'll see everybody next month, the next event. All right. All right. Have a good night.